it's a pleasure to do, be doing this with Vince. The time before when we got up and, uh, and actually uh, did something like this was when we were in Calgary and we received the Emerald Award together with Greta Raymond down in Calgary. So that was, that was a nice event. Yes, <laughs> so do I do the Vanna White thing and, uh, and move the slide forward? You're the closest. Okay. So presenters, as, uh, as Ken's already gone through, I'm a former senior process engineering advisor with Suncor, retired. Vince, uh, he's, uh, he's with EPCOR, he's the director of municipal operations and previous to that role, he, he, well he's had a couple of other roles, but uh, uh, he was at Gold Bar during uh, quite a bit of this project as well and his predecessors that I was familiar with and, and started working with back in 1998 with this project. So it took quite a while to, uh, to get this thing going. And as well, well we've, we've, we've met John. So with this here uh, tonight, what we'll do, uh, we'll walk you through the project drivers, outline the project scope. But there were a number of different challenges and uh, what, what we're pretty happy about, uh, I think, you know, from Frank's perspective and my perspective was how the two companies work together to, to resolve the issues. Um, and we really want to make sure that, that you folks understand the, the value that, uh, that this project had to the refinery. Okay, my turn. Um, Suncor uh, was in the midst of doing a major retrofit modification to the refinery. It was, uh, it had been processing uh, um, sweet uh, synthetic crudes and it was being converted over to process uh, bitumen derived fruit, or f fuels. Um, in addition to that, there were a couple of other legislative uh, wrinkles that were occurring at the same time. And that was the clean fuels legislation, so ultra low sulfur gasoline, ultra low sulfur diesel. All of those different drivers were going on at the same time that this project was going and we decided to combine a lot of that work all together. But what this meant was all of that desulfurization requirements meant a lot more hydrogen in order to desulfurize the bitumen. We went from a sulfur plant that uh, was rated for 40 tons um, a day to 400 tons a day. So we did a tenfold increase for the facility. We looked at a number of different options, uh, direct withdrawal from the river and the reclaimed water uh, approach as well. Uh, the biggest hurdle in getting the recycled water portion uh, convinced within the business community uh, wasn't really the project itself, it was the schedule. We had a very tight schedule in order to meet this project. So, I mean, as, as you can tell, um, we chose not to withdraw more water from the river and went with the uh, reclaimed water uh, system with EPCOR, Strathcona County. Strathcona County actually um, uh, uh, monitors the pipeline between uh, EPCOR and uh, the refinery. It was a win-win situation. Um, EPCOR, Gold Bar prior to that was looking for ways to uh, improve its, uh, its effluent discharge. They were looking at other revenue streams. They were looking at ways of, uh, of improving uh, on the environment. I had a chat with uh, a gentleman by the name of David Spink. I don't know if any of you remember him with Alberta Environment, but he put down a challenge back in 1995 when I was with uh, a different company uh, to find ways to utilize uh, reclaimed sanitary wastewater as industrial water feed. So we took the challenge. Suncor uh, was responsible for all of the costs related to the engineering procurement and construction of both the facilities at Gold Bar as well as the pipeline uh, which supplies both the air products uh, hydrogen plant and the uh, refinery. So the easy part, engineering the facility, that was easy. We needed to produce the right quality of water. Uh, as we said, the project started kind of early, 1999. It had gone through a couple of different uh, variations with a couple of other companies and was always rejected. So I met with your, for, your former uh, plant, manager. plant manager, Gene Emanuel, and we said, well, let's take a look at it. What do we need to really do in order to make this um, project a go and to make this water something that's uh, useful for industry? So we came up with a set of criteria for the water so that it could be reused in the industrial environment. And at that point in time, you also had uh, funding from Alberta Environment through uh, the Center of Excellence. So there were a number of 
of uh, students doing their master's and PhD in the basement at Goldbar looking at a whole variety of different uh, uh, approaches. And I believe Jeff Heisey was one of those that I remember meeting him in the, in the uh, catacombs of, uh, of Goldbar and he showed me his project at the time. So it's, it's interesting because Jeff is now uh, the operations. operations manager at, yeah. at Goldbar. So you never know what happens with your, your master's work. The, the interesting part was uh, the pipeline. We wound up running this pipeline through two city parks, slinging it under two bridges, and a third provincial park with the science park. And you're saying, well, why on earth would you do that? Well, because we weren't allowed to go under the river. Alberta environment wouldn't let us disturb the riverbed. This portion of the river is a class A reach of the river, which is stur sturgeon breeding grounds. So no disturbance in the river was allowed. So we had to take the long, circuitous route instead. Construction of the facilities at Goldbar uh, were completed in the latter part of 2005, just in time for the first plant with uh, air products. So there's a bit of a dis distinction there. Those two uh, air products plants are the first two hydrogen plants designed specifically to run on reclaimed sanitary wastewater. They actually don't have any cooling water systems there, so it's fully integrated as far as energy and water requirements. The water line is sized for future needs. Uh, it, we size it for 40 megaliters a day. Um, given at the time, we figured, well, it's better to put the pipe in. The cost of a little bit bigger pipe isn't uh, as much as trying to find another way to get the water line to the facilities afterwards. Our first uh, startup in 2005 with the First hydrogen plant was for five megaliters a day, and that came online like clockwork on around April time frame. It's since been expanded to the 15 megaliter mark when we got the second hydrogen plant and, and got in with uh, the final RCP expansion. The actual route, so here we take the technology. So we've got Gold Bar actually right down in this area right in here, and the pipeline, as you can follow this blue line, slings under the Ainsworth Dyer Bridge through uh, Rundle Park. This is Goldbar Park here, Rundle Park comes down through here. We didn't disturb any of the greens and fairways. We did a lot of directional drilling and we didn't touch any trees because the tree police were on our case. And if we touched one tree, that was bad news. We came along down in here, slung it under the uh, Science Park Bridge, dipsy doodled around in here to avoid some stuff. We brought it up and skirting around and following the railway tracks to avoid uh, any further uh, issues with uh, uh, construction in this area for additional projects, brought it up to the hydrogen plant here. And then there's also a line that comes right across under the road and supplies the refineries boiler feed water system here. So this is the place where I called home for 20 years. And what was interesting is that uh, the first time, I, I think as Frank mentioned, that uh, the first time I actually heard about uh, the Reclaim Water uh, uh, project was in 1997 when I, I was the, the new operations manager at Goldbar, back when my hair was black. And uh, before we had done, uh, we were about 20% uh, about of the way through $300 million worth of upgrades. So the upgrades at Goldbar that happened uh, through the course of the, of the 20 years that I was at Goldbar, had a lot to do with uh, the, the, the taking care of the nutrients uh, that are discharged back to the North Saskatchewan River. But the thing that was nice was that became the platform for Suncor to come and, and reclaim the water with us. So everything that you have here, if you can imagine from the front end of the plant to the back end of the plant, things get the, go from dirty to clean uh, th through the plant. Uh, Right in here are all our anaerobic digesters and the, the solids handling part of the plant. But as you get to, to the other side here, this is the, the normal discharge. And as Frank was mentioning, and we'll get into it a little bit uh, further on in, in the presentation, it was really neat for us because we were looking for ways to improve the overall total loading to the river. Well, there's absolutely nothing better than not discharging back to the river at all, especially if you're then taking care of water that would either come from the river or would come from potable. So then we had one area which is kind of back in our, our bone pile uh, at the, the east end of the site 
uh, that we set aside for our membrane plant. So this is it on the, on the east side uh, during construction. So the interesting thing about this is that when you start looking at the various different types of tur turbidity uh, when it comes to the river water, um, the interesting thing is gold bar water, other than during spring runoff, is a very, very stable product. The one thing that does happen is, uh, m many of you might not know, but uh, Edmonton is one of the, is the only combined sewer overflow uh, type of uh, sewer system in Alberta. It, it was fairly common back in the east, uh, so that it was a lot of the technology was brought from Ontario and New York and the rest of that when Edmonton was being developed. So consequently, if any of you work in, in downtown Edmonton and you flush your toilet, also uh, the, the flow goes to Gold Bar, but also the street runoff uh, goes to uh, Gold Bar as well. So for example, when I go to visit our corporate people at, at Epcor Tower, both the, the, the street runoff and the, the sewage goes to Gold Bar. So the interesting thing about that is during runoff situations or in situations like what we'll have this week where you get some snow, they add some salt to the, the streets, and then it goes to plus 10. We get the worst conditions for treatment to Gold Bar, uh, which is difficult for our microorganisms. But on the, the side here, when it comes to the reclaimed water, we, uh, we get more chlorides and connectivity and TDS coming through. One thing to point out here, when we look at the, uh, the quality of water from the reverse osmosis, these were the targets that we were looking at for our, our boiler feed water. In fact, uh, it, during operations, uh, we can get this down to under 15 and typically around 10 as far as the conductivity is concerned. Hardness is uh, more in line with about 0.01. Uh, SDI isn't measured because it, uh, it is that clean. And uh, silica, uh, we've, we've got it down to 0.005 or something like that. So it's, it's fairly low. Uh, it's, it's excellent quality water. And uh, I think John would say that the boilers are actually running quite nicely with the new RO quality feed compared to the old hot lime softener. SDI is called silt density index. It's a way of measuring uh, the amount of, uh, of solids that are uh, in a particular water stream. So for a reverse osmosis unit, you require water that is very low in silt density index. And the target for an RO feed is less than a three but with the membrane systems that we've got at Gold Bar, the SDI is usually not measured. The one thing with this, now Frank, you have your, um, uh, your little prop of the... the Absolutely. Yeah, so why don't we maybe pass that around? Okay. Because the interesting thing about a membrane filter, and, it, it, and when we first started looking at these at Gold Bar, some of our consultants, some of which are actually in the... the, the, the uh, uh, Straight the from the Gold Bar. Tonight. Thank you. We've had, we no. had very interesting feedback from them that soon, this is in the 90s, soon membranes would be a commodity. And sure enough, they basically are. So what you see here in that piece of spaghetti that is being passed out is there's a hollow tube with a bunch of holes on the side. And the reason why it's actually cost effective compared to RO where you're, you're pushing the water through is with these types of membranes, you actually suck it through with with uh, negative pressure on either side. So the amount of power that's being used is, is much, much less than what you would s normally see with RO. And that's why uh, you're starting to see now that on both the drinking water and the, the, the wastewater side that uh, these membranes uh, are, are, are cost effective from a life cycle perspective. So what we put in at Gold Bar was basically ultra filtration. And you can see back in here that it takes out an awful lot of uh, the, the different types of particle sizes. Did you want to comment on anything? Yeah, right? the, the membrane that you're seeing there is the, is the Z-Weed 500 Series D membrane. It has an average pore size of 0.04 microns. So when you look at that on the scale that you've got here, it's right in here. It's just under the area where viruses are. So, and that's very important to understand. Those membranes were typically in use prior to one of our applications in potable water production. So they were used for filtering um, uh, surface waters like lake water and producing drinking water. And primarily for that reason, because it's a physical barrier to pathogens. One of the other things too is because we were going through so many upgrades at Goldbark, uh, very similar to what the, the Suncor refinery was going through, 
that what we decided to do is we used uh, membranes that would be that could be used for um, membrane bioreactors. And what that means is that even though we were using them as a tertiary filter, which is uh, the water that comes off of the clarifiers, they, uh, the, the membrane was designed to, to actually work in much dirtier water, uh, about two or three orders of magnitude uh, dirtier than what, what it is that we, we had. And the reason why we chose that membrane was we knew we had uh, different production targets that we had to meet both quality and quantity day in, day out for, for Suncor, and we couldn't take the risk of of uh, following the membranes. So this is what you end up seeing here. Um, so you put in the, the various different uh, types of material. Uh, you apply that, uh, that, uh, the, the, the negative pressure to it and uh, it sucks the, the clean water out through the permeate and it's a permeate pump at minus one to minus eight PSI. And then the waste sludge uh, then goes out of the membranes back into the plant. The thing that we have going for us at Gold Bar is we, you know, even though the plant, uh, the membrane plant is only 15 megaliters a day, the actual plant is set up for, on average, about uh, 310 to 420 million liters a day. So we have a lot of capacity to deal with these sludges. So with the project scope here, um, what we were able to do, as uh, I think Frank had mentioned, is that Suncor looked after the, the capital construction what we did is we did the design, construction, and the operation maintenance of, of the project, but uh, Suncor uh, contributed the capital for that. With the pipeline, the capital construction uh, was, and the operations and maintenance was done by um, a contractor, and, uh, and then Strathcona County does the operations and maintenance. Um, with our, from our side, uh, we have to coordinate any of the facility construction or downtime or anything like that with the pipeline operation with, with Strathcona County. When it came to the reverse osmosis and the hydrogen and steam, basically, as uh, you heard Frank mention, that that's been contracted to Air Products. Uh, they did their own design, construction, and operation and maintenance. And we, our concern there is making sure that they have their base water demand looked after. And then also, of course, uh, there's different seasonal water demands when it comes to the, the reverse osmosis for the boiler feed water. So it's really kind of interesting seeing the overlay of the refinery seasons with our seasons and making sure that we're coming up with a sweet spot to, to uh, uh, continue the water. So this is the type of, of membrane product water. Again, this is more in line with, with what you would see out of a drinking water plant. And Frank, uh, the one thing that I did want to mention here is that this is the area here that, that uh, was of the most concern during startup. We actually had, we were, we were running into issues where uh, we had not, uh, we had chemical feed to deal with our phosphorus and we were able to now, I, I think now that we have the biological nutrient removal working at Gold Bar, uh, they're running at, at much lower than that other than a, a few times of the year when they do get some phosphorus spikes. Uh, beyond that, maybe Frank, these numbers mean a lot more to you on the refinery side, so why don't you speak to those? Some of these numbers uh, were from earlier. The turbidity that you see here, uh, we typically see quite a lot lower turbidity. When a lot of these uh, numbers were generated, we, we had a, an issue with some of the couplings uh, on the membrane systems themselves where the O-rings hadn't uh, seated and sealed properly. So when we were doing our operations reviews and we would see the water quality results, periodically we'd see uh, a result of E. coli showing up in the membrane produced water. And in the reviews I would always say, okay, there's something either wrong with our sampling, there's something either wrong with the testing, uh, we cannot have E. coli because we have a physical barrier, it cannot be there. So it was a telltale. And then that's when EPCOR uh, took the lead and actually went through and did some checks with some bubble tests and found some, uh, some issues with the, uh, with the couplings. Uh, after that was done, uh, these particle count numbers have dropped tremendously. It's like um, a cliff and they're uh, quite a lot lower than that. They're under 100 uh, right now, typically. So then with this, this, this gives you an idea. The one thing that is interesting about gold bar water is because of the geography of the, the soils that we have that, that our sewers run through, and because of the type of water that we get uh, from the North Saskatchewan River from our potable water, there's a lot of alkalinity. Uh, for any of you who are thinking of retiring in BC, 
BC, there's very little alkalinity. So it's, it's a very, very different uh, type of water and it's kind of interesting and you even notice it in the taste. Uh, but th why that is of concern is we want to make sure that we're, we're taking things out uh, so that there isn't the, the fouling that, that could uh, cause problems over at the Suncor refinery. The, the reason we're even looking at uh, the hardness here and one of the measurements of it is, is the Langlier saturation index. Uh, when we started up the, uh, the boiler feed water system, we hadn't taken that into consideration in part of the uh, heat integration that we had done. And over a period of about six to eight months, the hardness of the water was starting to scale up our feed preheat uh, exchange train in the RO system. And as a result, we started to lose some of that preheat. And one of the things that improves an RO's efficiency and productivity is a good stable feed temperature. When we lost about 10 degrees of temperature, we lost about 25% of the production out of the ROs just from that temperature alone. So we had to redo part of that uh, feed effluent exchange uh, system to uh, recover that. So, so now we're just gonna walk you through some of the, the more physical aspects. So again, this was the, the membrane treatment facility under construction. You start to see the interesting thing about those fibers is there's gajillions of them in these cassettes. And the interesting thing that I've uh, often found with it is there's really nothing too fancy about running it. Like I, I uh, learned my time at Gold Bar, uh, my focus was learning how to run the biological nutrient removal side. So there you're dealing with microorganisms that are as sensitive as sometimes your teenagers. And um, what we found with this is you put it on and it runs. Now the interesting thing about it is it does need good design and good engineering because what we found when we were actually commissioning these systems, and we'll show you some of the piping back down in here, is that um, we tried to run it without our, uh, our SCADA system and with our distributed control system and you, it physically two operators could not switch the valves uh, quick enough. So the long and the short of it is if you know 30 years ago this would not have been possible without the automation that we have. So again, what you see here, you know, the, the, with that simplified diagram now, what you have is cassettes upon cassettes upon cassettes. So when I, when I get, used to give tours, it was the most boring part of the tour was seeing the membrane facility because it was nice and clean and everything was just all covered and there was nothing really to see. So this is where the, the membranes are suspended. We, we uh, uh, apply the, the negative pressures here. You have the raw sewage coming in. You have the, the uh, permeate coming out the top here, and then the sludge bay in there, and you can see what it looks like uh, outside. This is the five and a half kilometer pipeline to our 135,000 barrels a day. Uh, now, John, I should ask, is that what the production number is now, or I imagine it's much higher? 142 as of January next year. As of January next year, okay, so we'll... Break. Okay. So, and this gives you an idea of the difference uh, here in uh, the style between the Z-Weed uh, at Gold Bar, which is, again is submersed membranes, uh, versus the reverse osmosis that, that is at both the refinery and at the hydrogen plant. And uh, Frankie, you can speak to that, this now. So this basically uh, shows you in a nice pictorial fashion, uh, the water flow as it comes from the effluent of the uh, uh, biological nutrient process, goes through the Z-weed, goes through their permeate uh, pump. From there, it's pumped through the five and a half kilometer pipeline. Uh, it goes to tankage at the hydrogen plants where it's boosted through a set of cartridge filters and then goes into uh, a feed pump for the RO systems. From there, the rejects are basically uh, sent off uh, site for uh, discharge. Uh, goes through a polishing uh, zeolite softener into the permeate tank and then is provided as feed to the uh, hydrogen plant. The refinery, on the other hand, has a slightly different configuration. That's because I wound up designing it. I didn't like the standard approach. We have the, the same uh, upstream side of it. We go through a set of, uh, of cartridge filters again and these are basically uh, insurance in the event that there are any particulates in the pipeline. This pipeline is five and a half kilometers, it's epoxy lined, so uh, it, it shouldn't have any, uh, any corrosion products. So we've got a cartridge filter here, 
We go to uh, RO booster pumps directly, and in this case, it's different again because these are steam-driven turbine pumps. Feeds the RO system. The rejects from the RO system actually goes to cooling water makeup, so it's not discharged directly. From there, we go through a bank of uh, sodium zeolite polishers as a uh, protection. Then the water is de-aerated, and what you don't see here is the feed effluent uh, heat exchange train that uh, preheats the RO water. Otherwise, this would be pretty, uh, pretty messy to see all the lines going back and forth. And then this is now stored as permeate or boiler feed water. So the big difference between the way uh, the air product system runs, they store gold bar uh, reclaimed water in tankage as feed to the system. We actually have no gold bar water stored on the Suncor site at all. It's directly coupled to the pipeline, to the RO uh, booster pumps, and the, the facility stores clean boiler feed water. They have anywhere from 24 to 36 hours of uh, boiler feed water in the storage tank. And then from there, it's fed to the boiler feed water system. Before I walk you through some of the slides that have to do with the project development and how we solved the, a lot of the issues that came up, the one thing that I, I'd have to say, uh, just back on those configurations, um, our operators at Gold Bar really prefer the, the Suncor configuration compared to the, the air products because there's a lot more sensitivity when it comes to running the pipeline. Uh, it, basically, it's one line and you've only got two customers. Normally, you know, for any of you, uh, like when you go home tonight, when you want to, if you wanted to take a shower or run some water, there's water uh, taps going on and off all over Edmonton tonight. So the pressure just kind of balances out. When you have a long line like this, the impacts of having only one or two customers is huge. If I had been on the, the original design team, I probably would have said, you know, I really like the idea of storing the gold bar water because it just seemed to make sense at the time. But now when I you know, see it uh, from the point of view of the operator afterwards, uh, having the stored uh, product water is definitely the way to go. So. so when we look at it here, the project development, uh, you know, the factor we were looking at when it came to water quality was Suncor, if they were going to have to go to the river, there was going to be variable water quality. One thing that I've also learned since uh, 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 Gold Bar left the city of Edmonton and, and joined EPCOR is, uh, many of you might not know that, that the turbidity in the North Saskatchewan River is actually worse than the Mississippi River at certain times of the year. So that makes it really difficult because the systems have to be designed, the, the, you know, if you're using them for industrial water or for potable water, they have to be designed for that worst case scenario that comes along. And it comes along um, at different times of the year. So Suncor was looking at variable uh, river water quality. From EPCOR, we were able to provide them with a stable water uh, product uh, quality. The operating costs that were substantial due to that were they were incremental because as you saw, we had uh, basically the, the replacement value of the gold bar plant is about 750 million bucks. So adding on uh, the, uh, the Suncor membrane plant was not a big stretch for us because we had all of the solids handling uh, there in place and all of the work upstream that was needed. Uh, our core business, you know, of course Suncor's core business is refining and upgrading. And for us uh, in EPCOR, it's wastewater treatment, but it's also water production. So we understand what it means to, to supply. When it came to how we resolve some of the issues that came out of, out of this, um, you know, as we mentioned, Suncor decided that they wanted to fund it all. Um, and uh, so we did the, the design build on that. How we ended up dealing with the operating costs was through uh, a commercial agreement uh, that we were able to write. And it was kind of interesting. Uh, Part of the reason why Gold Bar was transferred from the city of Edmonton to EPCOR was primarily to be able to do business with co companies like Suncor. Um, I think uh, just before John, John joined the refinery, we had to rewrite all of the agreements between city of Edmonton and, and Petrocan as EPCOR and Suncor. And there were three agreements that literally every time that you wanted to figure something out, you had to cross-reference three agreements. And what was really quite cool was, was how well we were able to, to paper it afterwards. Um, so with the core business, the idea is to allow them to concentrate on the refining and upgrading, and we concentrate on the water. So the interesting thing on the, the regulatory drivers, uh, for us, what was kind of cool was the federal government was doing the marketing for us. 
because the federal government uh, put in the desulfurization requirements, which then begat the upgrades at the Suncor refinery. They needed more hydrogen. They needed more water. Uh, on the provincial side, both, uh, and, and uh, John and I, uh, I used to sit on the board with John on the Strathcona Industrial Association. So all of the big water users are always looking for ways that we can conserve water and also minimize our impacts back to the North Saskatchewan River. With, uh, with Gold Bar, we had the Water uh, for Life initiative where we were operating under new permits where we had to look at different total loadings. And uh, with EPCOR Water uh, on the waterworks side, we actually had to amend the diversion license because uh, 15 megaliters a day was not going to be going back to the river. And then, as I mentioned here, we, uh, we had a number of commercial contracts where EPCOR had uh, uh, the contract with Suncor, but Suncor had contracts with us, Strathcona County, and Air Products. So with the design and construction, uh, we were looking at uh, a variety of different things. Uh, we were used to having monthly average when it came to our uh, water quality. But Suncor couldn't tolerate a, a monthly average, so we had to work to a daily average. So that was a, a different standard for us. Redundancy was, a, was much different in that uh, Suncor looked at things from a risk-based perspective and also from uh, repair it during turnaround, where we were used to putting in redundancy because we're a 24 by 7 utility. What was interesting is things changed when we moved from the design and project people to the operations and maintenance folks because they wanted to have utility-based uh, uh, reliability as well. All of the design decisions, our, our cultures matched uh, pretty well. They were all risk-based, and the financial review was detailed. I'll guarantee you that we had more accountants than you could shake a stick at working on this project. Uh, when it comes to the operations and maintenance, Again, the issue really was around the consistent supply of the water quality and the dissolved solids. Um, communication was, was really critical, especially when it came to outage management on our side because uh, part of the thing was, you know, initially I think the, the logic was, uh, well, we can just design this so that it'll run from one turnaround to the next. Well, during turnaround, that's when they need the water. So. Uh, when it came to outage management, again, well, we were able to set things up so that there were financial uh, uh, consequences uh, through our commercial agreement, and it's kept us uh, all on the straight and narrow so that between ourselves, Air Products, um, and, uh, um, and Strathcona County, we're all working to make sure that uh, we keep the refinery going for Suncor. And again, um, you know, the O&M side of it, at, you know, our customer really is the, is the refinery here uh, that we're working towards, and we're seen as being a utility for Suncor. So, Frank, I'll turn it back to you on the model of the refinery. Okay. So, we, we've seen the part uh, that uh, led up to this portion. This is some of the details around the boiler feed water system that we installed to take advantage of the gold bar water at the refinery. The ROs are only this small portion of it. Uh, what you have over here are uh, turbine-driven uh, pumps to uh, feed the ROs. And the main reason for them being steam-driven is so that uh, we can operate the RO plant even in a power outage. We have uh, zeolite polishers here. These are regenerated every three months. So they're only there as, uh, as an insurance uh, uh, policy in the event that we have some sort of a failure in an RO membrane and we get a, an excursion in the water quality. Um, but the membranes here have uh, lasted for five years and I believe they're just starting to replace them now. We have uh, clean in place systems here so that uh, all of the RO membranes can be cleaned on a regular basis and rejuvenated. There is some uh, uh, fouling that occurs but the cleaning process cleans them up. We have a chemical storage here, and here's the deaerator located way up above here. We used to call this thing our bungee jumping uh, tower, the way it was built. Everybody kept asking me, why is it so tall? Why is it, why is it so tall? I wanted to do bungee jumping, no. Uh, the, the fact is, this is, again, a different style of deaerator. Normally, a deaerator has a collection vessel underneath it. This deaerator does not have a collection vessel directly underneath it. It has a huge one right here, and it's called the boiler feed water storage tank. 
So that deaerator had to be at an elevation higher than the top of the boiler feed water storage tank. So gravity could do its marvelous wonders and allow the water to flow directly into the tank and I didn't have to pump it again. I re resolved by uh, saving three additional pumps by elevating that tank. So this is the inside of the building. You can see the, uh, the RO cartridges are, are maybe 10 to 15% of the total footprint of the entire building. It's huge on the inside. There's a, a 10 ton gantry crane that goes across so that you can do all of your maintenance and pull pumps and turbines and anything you want anywhere and drop it uh, at the overhead doors. Some of the significant milestones. The pipeline was completed in December of 2005. The Z-weed membranes were online producing five megaliters a day, so uh, Gold Bar was actually uh, processing the water and discharging it uh, probably back to the river while they were approving their systems. In April 2006, the first hydrogen plant came online and supplied uh, hydrogen to the refinery. In October 2007, those Z-weed membranes were expanded to 15 megaliters a day. They came online uh, quite nicely. In April 2008, the uh, second hydrogen plant became operational. In June 2009, the refinery uh, commissioned its new boiler feed water systems with the RO uh, system and uh, finally shut down their, uh, their hot lime softener. And actually, before we leave that, that one slide, um, what was interesting was the day that we uh, had the grand opening, uh, there was a couple of things I remember about that particular day. One was the plaque was probably the, the crowning jewel of the project. So getting the plaque signed between Petro Canada, uh, City of Edmonton, and Strathcona County, the only people that really got it over the goal line had to be the, the folks from Petrocan. So it was, it was quite interesting. Um, the second thing was the day that we had the grand opening was also the day that uh, we received a letter asking us to upgrade uh, to 15 megaliters a day. So you could tell that we, we really had something uh, here that everybody was proud of. So as you can see here, uh, you know, the, the turbidity of uh, the, the discharge from Gold Bar compared to the, the river is, is quite significantly less. Um, the SDI here was, was well under the target, um, and I think, uh, as we've said, I think Frank and I are going to have to adapt this because uh, we're taking this from some of the work that was done in 06 and 07. And since the, the again, the tune-up of, of Gold Bar and of the membrane plant, uh, our SDI uh, values are much lower. Also with the phosphate, uh, we did have total phosphorus excursions. But now uh, the plant runs well under uh, one milligram per liter, which is our provincial requirement. The influent connectivity, uh, the one thing with that is uh, we do see excursions that will hit two and three thousand uh, uh, during uh, spring runoff. Um, and again, it has to do with the salt on the roads. And then, Frank, I'll let you talk about the, the saturation index. I remember this from graduate school where they were talking about uh, deposition on pipes, but it means different for deposition in boilers. Absolutely. So this came up to the forefront when we, we started having issues with the, uh, the preheat exchange train and uh, we needed a, a way of determining um, the tendency of the, of the water to uh, uh, cause scaling. And when we reviewed it, we said, well, okay, we're in that range where we're talking about uh, doing the preheat for the, uh, the RO system. So by utilizing this information, we redesigned the, uh, the feed preheat exchange system so that uh, we didn't put uh, the gold bar water in any temperature regions where it would cause scaling. So much the same as you would design a, a cooling water system where you would design your maximum uh, cooling water temperatures to stay out of your scaling region because your cooling water is, is, is hard as well. We had to use those same lessons here as well. So as you can see there, we started tracking it and it was hovering around uh, the neutral point. And uh, w once we got everything in place, well, we really didn't care too much afterwards because we managed to resolve it with some hardware as opposed to uh, trying to do some upfront management at, at Gold Bar. So some of the areas uh, that still need a little bit of uh, improvement is probably around the chlorination control. And one of the main reasons we have chlorination there is due to the fact that Air Products stores the Gold Bar 
uh, reclaimed water in a tank. So the chlorination is there to prevent microbial growth in the storage tank while it's sitting there waiting to be used for RO feed. The phosphorus, we've already talked about that. Uh, the addition of the uh, anaerobic digesters and the, uh, the new fermenters, the new fermenters yeah. uh, dealt with that uh, tremendously and is no longer an issue. TDS, TDS when it comes to uh, running with an RO system, uh, it's a non-issue. I mean, they're designed to remove TDS. So having a TDS excursion uh, uh, with the uh, RO membranes that were selected for the uh, refinery, um, it doesn't even see a blip when we get the surface runoff with the added chlor uh, chlorides uh, from the salt and everything. So, But if I remember right, the, at, at Air Products, they were de designed a lot tighter so that there were issues with theirs. There were the, issues with theirs, issues with yeah. Them. So... As Frank mentioned, I think there was something like 13 or 14 different uh, uh, awards that the project ended up winning. Uh, so th these are the ones here. The one in red is the one where, uh, where Frank and I uh, got to accept that uh, in Calgary. And it was kind of interesting because we walked in and there's these Emerald Awards and I'd never been to them before and it was kind of like walking in with a rock star because everybody uh, seemed to know who Frank was and I was just your... Uh, the, the other half of the Emerald Awards were you didn't know whether you won until the night when they actually read the announcement. So we knew we were a finalist of three right. in the category, but we did not know that we had won until they read our names out at the, at the podium. So then also with that too, you know, between the Engineering Association and, and uh, uh, also I, I think it was, uh, you know, as you can see here, a number of, of different national associations uh, recognize the work that that was done here because it was quite groundbreaking. So, just as a bit of a, a recap here, it is the first major industrial application of membrane treatment technology with municipal water treatment in Canada, and still is. Um, we know the technology exists to allow industry to make a more effective use and better environmental decisions in how we get our our water systems. Membrane technology is very cost effective. Uh, in the 10, 15 years since we started looking at this, the cost of membrane systems have dropped tremendously. So it's even uh, an easier decision from a capital perspective as far as the membranes are concerned. The membrane replacements are probably the lowest portion of your capital now than they are for the entire system. And then the working together part. Yeah, so this, this is the part that I, I really enjoyed. Um, both of our organizations evolved. As you can see, Suncor evolved uh, out of Petro Canada uh, with the, the merger there. And then at, with Goldbar uh, in 2009, we transitioned from city ownership to EPCOR ownership. And as I mentioned, it was primarily so we could, we could do commercial arrangements just like what we have here with, uh, with Suncor. The players changed, and believe you me, it was very, very different. Um, you know, the people that were all worried about uh, the, the pennies when it came to the project, they were replaced by the O&M people that thought a lot more like us O&M people at Gold Bar. And it was kind of like, you mean you made that decision? Yes, well, okay. Then we had to figure out how to work it around it. And it was really quite neat to, to work that through. And, uh, you know, one of the, the, the other fellows uh, that worked with Frank at, at Suncor, Kevin Borch, uh, was uh, sat on our committees and, and uh, he, really helped us uh, make sure that we got our, our risk of both companies aligned very well. There was also very good governance, I thought, because we had a strategic group, we had a steering group when it came to looking at, you know, it, did we need more capital versus the, uh, the working group, which was our operations manager, the people from Strathcona County, and the people that managed the utilities, which was Kevin at, at, at Suncor. So with our conclusions here, you know, alignment can be achieved through teamwork. And it was really interesting to see the two industries that had never worked together uh, work on the basis of what, what was in common. We had different cultural differences. We were very uh, risk averse, uh, whereas, you know, Suncor had, uh, had more of a commercial mindset. Fast forward a few years now, we have more of a commercial mindset uh, since we're part of EPCOR. And I think learning different ways to, to solve the same problem is healthy uh, because oftentimes, you know, we'd sit at the table and we'd say, well, we have this problem and so-and-so would say, well, jeepers, will we just solve it this way? And then we'd say, well, we solve it that way. Well, then we had to figure out how to solve it together. 
It's pretty cool. One thing I, I did learn through the EPCOR transition was a, was a, a term that um, I think really is embodied by this, is that good paper makes good friends. And that's where, as I mentioned, when we rewrote the, the agreement, we, we tried to write it in plain English so that our successors down the road, you know, now that Frank is retired and other people uh, are at, at the refinery and I've moved on, uh, there's, there's other people that can carry it on. And it, it's really quite cool. And I, again, it was a win for the company. It was a win for, uh, for EPCOR. It was a win for Suncor, a win for EPCOR, and it was a win for the environment. And again, through our acknowledgments, we'd really like to acknowledge Frank, who was, as I said, he was the proponent from back in uh, the, the late 90s. Uh, and Kevin was is absolutely great to work with on the operations side, uh, the utilities manager at, at Suncor. Um, the, the two people that I would have to really recognize on the EPCOR side was Jeff Heisey, as, as Frank mentioned, he was our uh, operations manager who succeeded me. In, uh, when I became plant manager, he, he took over from me as operations manager. And he did his master's degree in how to treat uh, phosphorus using membranes. And then uh, kind of our mad scientist when it came to the, the project was Abdul Mohammed. And I, Abdul and I were hired on the same day back in 1991 at Gold Bar. And we, we worked together to spend $300 million over the time that he and I worked together. And uh, he, uh, you know, once Abdul was, was like a dog with a bone. Once the, the concept was there, we agreed on it. Uh, he pushed, pushed it through from the EPCOR side. Well, anybody who's seen email correspondence from me, this is, uh, this is basically the, the footer on my emails. I came across this uh, quote by Admiral Hyman Rickover, who founded the nuclear submarine program in the U.S., basically saying good ideas are not adopted automatically. They must be driven into practice with courageous patience. And considering I started working on this project in 1999 and had to wait until about 2009 to see it come to fruition, 10 years, yeah, I think I was kind of dogmatic at getting it done. So here's the journey we've taken you through. We've taken you on the journey of the wastewater from your toilet. We've processed it into a high quality reclaimed water system that's suitable to be used to make steam and hydrogen to clean and process your fuels that eventually you put into your gas tank. So there's your approach. Uh, how environmentally friendly can you get?